So hi everyone, I'm Lin Tian from IQC University of Waterloo. Today I'm going to share our state of development of an all electric single photon source, uh, as well as with a set reset gating protocol that we came up with to ensure reliable and continuous emissions. So single photon source is a light source that emits a single for indistinguishable single photon in a deterministic way on demand and with high brightness. Their applications include, sorry. So their applications include quantum LIDAR, quantum key distributions. Generally speaking, there are two broad categories of single photon source based on their excitation schemes. They either optically driven or electrically driven. The optically driven ones have seen tremendous progress in the last two decades. I just listed two examples here. One is the spontaneous parametric down conversion, and the other one is semiconductor quantum dot. The SPDC in a nonlinear crystal, it has the state of art of entanglement fidelity but it's a random generation process, which is not on demand. Also, it suffers from low efficiency. The efficiency could be improved, but at a cost of multi-photon emission. On the other hand, the semiconductor quantum dot, it is on, on demand with a high efficiency and a high fidelity. But you do need a very sophisticated excitation schemes like resonant excitation with ultra-fast laser to work. And uh, their typical working frequency is limited to tens of megahertz. In comparison, the electrically driven ones, they have a few advantages over optical driven ones. Like first, they don't need a laser to work, which could greatly reduce the system size. Also, it's more feasible to integrate it and scale up with current semiconductor devices. Uh, the photon will only be generated when one electrical trigger is sent to the device, making it truly on demand at a high frequency. Given all these advantages, there aren't many electrically driven single photon sources available. Recently, the group in Cambridge shared uh, their work on this which they use surface acoustic wave to drive electrons to a nano LED, working at a four gigahertz frequency. We also base our design on LED. So to deliver precise number of electrons to the LED junction, we use a pump in the design. So that's a single electron pump. I mean, there are two main components to our design is a single electron pump and a nano LED. So one key component of our design is the single electron pump. The type of pump we based our design on is called a tunable electron pump or a dynamic quantum dot where a virtual potential dot is created by using gate potentials. The way it works is when your entrance get here is below your Fermi level, many electrons get loaded into your potential dot. When the entrance get rises up, some electrons will escape and go back to the source. When your uh, entrance get is higher than your exit get, the electrons get ejected to the drain region. The number of electrons ejected can be controlled by your get voltages. That's why it's called a tunable electron pump. There are a few advantages of this type of pump compared to turnstile pump. First, it does not need a source and drain bias to drive the current. It could work at a high operating frequency up to gigahertz, making it non-adiabatic. At last, there is only one IF gate involved here, making it a more simple and robust design. So the top left view show the top left shows the schematic view of our device. You can see three levels of insulated gate in this design. The top gate is indicated by black dashed lines where it induces sources of electron for pump pumping. 
this pair of rectangular get here defines the 1D channel. So there is no etching involved here, which makes the device more reproducible. And the quantum dynamic dot is first confined by this entrance and exit get. When you look at the cross view of this device, the omega contact here, the gold germanium nickel, they are the electron reservoirs in the device because there's no dopant in here. They have a recessed structure to promote lateral diffusion of uh, electrons. The right side is an SEM of our device. The dynamic quantum dot is generated uh, in this 400 by 400 nanometer squares. The top left figure shows uh, we have a widely tunable electron density as a function of the top get voltage. It is linearly dependent, there is no hysteresis here. Also, the mobility is very high over a large electron density range. The middle figure shows as a device, it has very low leakage current at an elevated 77 Kelvin temperature. The last figure is the most important characterization of a single electron pump. The quantized current plateaus here. The black curve is the experimental data. The yellow curve is the fitting to the first plateau. So what happens in a single electron pump is their current is defined as N times E times F. N is the number of electrons ejected out per pulse. E is the electron charge, and F is the driving frequency. So when you look at, look at the figure, the N equals one here means there is only one electron per pulse ejected here. We look at the second line here, it means there are two electrons ejected in this plateau, then three electrons for example. So we have, uh, we have operated the pump up to a gigahertz range at 4 Kelvin, which is actually a high temperature for a pump to work. Also, this is the first electron pump in dopant free gas and all gas material systems. We all know that multi photon emission is a problem for some optically driven systems. What about in an electrically driven source with a pump in it? So, when we'll look at this simulated probability curve here, the probability to have one electron per pulse can be higher than 99% when the probability to have empty pulses and uh, multiple electron pulses are minimized. This simulation is done in 2013. Actually, recently, there is uh, one experimental data shows they could have as little as 30 error pulses per million emission of single electrons. Another great point of our design is uh, the potential to reach entangled photon pairs with the, by simply changing electrical input. So if the pump is working at the second plateau here, if we could initialize that pair of electrons to in single light state, that would become spin polarized, spin entangled. Then that would be preserved into polarization entangled photons, which means our device could not only work as a single photon source, but also as an entangled photon source by simply changing the electrical parameters. So, okay. So now we have a working single electron pump to get a single photon source. The obvious way is actually just to hook up this single electron pump to an LED. Unfortunately, this will not work. The reason being, first, electrons, single electrons will not travel far in such heavily doped environment in a conventional LED. Second, even if some electrons do make it to the junction, due to the large area of the LEDs, their collection efficiency will be very low. And third, it has to be a fast LED, means in gigahertz range LED. To combat all this, we need to come up a way to deliver precise number of electrons to the junction directly. 
That means to integrate the pump to the LED design, we also need to create a high mobility environment to prevent any electron loss during transportation. That could include dupont free structure and avoid aging surfaces and active regions. Uh, so here is the design we came up with. It's based on a lateral junction in dupont free gas a uh, gallium arsenic and aluminum gallium arsenic systems, the same material we use for our pump. In here, the pump, the electrons will only need to travel in, an, uh, in this intrinsic, uh, uniform and high mobility layer to reach the junction. Another added benefit of the dupont free is, we could have ambipolar operation. What does ambipolar mean? It means you could switch the source and drain on the fly by simply switching voltages. Uh, this seemingly freebie turns out to be a very important feature to our design, which I will explain later. The top left figure shows a cross view of our design shared the same material as the pump. The bottom is a, one image of our actual device. There are three pairs of PN and ohmic on the same region. It's a very symmetrical device. The right side is a simulated band structure in such dupont free uh, materials. The top one shows when there is no gate voltages applied, the energy band and Fermi level are flat. When there is a positive voltage applied on the top surface, the energy band bends downwards. The Fermi level crosses the bottom of the conduction band may cause the electrons to accumulate here. Uh, similarly, you could also have a hose accumulation if you use negative voltage on the top gate. That's how we create a PN junction without any dupont. So despite uh, of no dupont involved, we still get uh, an ideal, I, ideal junction behavior. When you look at the red curve here, that's the IV curve from the device. So the turn on is around 1.5 volt, which is close to the gallium arsenic band gap. The rising in the shop, there is minimal leakage current on the reverse bias, making it ideal LED. The difference between the PN mode and the NP mode here is uh, the ambipolar operation. PN simply means the left side of region used as P, and right is N. NP means left use as N, right use as P. So it's the performance from the same device. We also collected a very clean and uh, similar spectrum from both operations. That's the EL spectrum from our nano LED. So one problem we discovered during, when operating our device is that uh, it decays very fast, both electrically and optically. After initial turn on at a certain point, there is no light emitted. When you look at uh, this EL intensity versus time plot, when the bias voltage around 1.5 volt, this blue curve, the light is gone in 10 seconds. When you look at this green curve at 1.52 volt PN bias, the EL intensity is stronger, but it also decays faster. That uh, indicates there are charges built up in the device somewhere. In order for the device to perform again, we have to reset the device by going through thermal cycle from cryogenic temperature to room temperature, then cool it back down again. This could easily take a day. I mean, this poses a problem. We set out to design, to build a reliable continuous operation single photon source. This whole thermal cycling thing just made it impossible. It's also not on demand, not practical. We need to come up a way to deal with this. Uh, further research into the literature also shows this is not a unique problem for our devices. For a few groups that are doing lateral pin junction, they also see similar unstability or decay problem with their devices. So remember the ambipolar operation I mentioned about our device? It turns out to be the key to solve our problems. So we could uh, reset uh, the charge in the device by, by, uh, by sweeping, by changing the gate voltages. 
we could also reach continuous operation by switching the get voltage at a frequency. That's what we called set reset getting protocols. So that means that's how we switch the gets here. So with this, the device still behave like an ideal, ideal junction. This is IV with set and reset. We suspect the actual IV, this is experiment data too, but we suspect the performance is better than this. Here it's limited. So what I mean by better, it means it's sharper than here. Uh, this one is limited by the sampling rate of our measurement setup. So, but there's a concern here. If you are switching the type of carries in the same device at a red, will that also generate light? So we look into that, it turns out the main lighting mechanism is still through the junction, which means, as you can see here, when the bias is below 1.51 volt, there's basically nothing there. Uh, the EL intensi intensity is proportional to the PM bias you apply that indicate the light is indeed generated through the junction. Also, the light intensity increases will increase the get uh, the set reset frequency. Because now we have a continuous operating device, we could uh, we carried out a few more optical characterizations here. When look at the EL performance of our device, this main peak is excitation peak in gas materials. The side peak is a charge peak in gas materials. Uh, we uh, we look at the fullest half man, maximum of this main peak. Ours are among the narrowest in the literature. We could also shift the emission wavelength by using different quantum well width. Here, the data is about 15 nanometer quantum wells. So we mentioned the single electron pump could work up to gigahertz range. What about this nano LEDs? So we did another interesting experiment to figure that out. Here, the gets are operated at one kilohertz with set reset protocols. The PN bars across the junction is composed of one DC baseline and one RF pulse. That DC baseline is kept pretty low below the threshold. Okay to minimize any emission caused by DC. And the IF pulse will overcome the potential, overcome the threshold, generate light. And indeed, we have observed pulsed EL emission in our device. This is the time resolved EL measurement. The sync signal is the electrical trigger from the IF pulse. When we look at the lifetime of our EL emission, it is very short, only 168 picoseconds, and possibly limited by the timing data of our APDs too, which means this nano LED could easily work up to gigahertz range. So now we have a working single electron pump and a working nano LEDs. The next step is to combine them together to make a single photon source. That is what we're currently working on now. Uh, we're also working on to add the DBR and micro cavity to improve uh, collection efficiency for single photon cells. After those, we could work on time correlated or spin tangled photon pairs. Lastly, uh, we could also include indium gallium arsenic to reach telecom wavelength emissions. So this is a collaborated project between three groups in the University of Waterloo. Quantum photonic devices led by Professor Michael Reimer and the MI lab by Prof. David Wachleski and quantum transport device lab by Prof. Jonathan Ball and Prof. Francis Sfagakis. I would also like to thank all the funding agencies for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for this talk.